so I should probably have some background music or something like that running right now but hi everyone I'm Stephen Downs and uh, I'm doing the interview for Neil Hughes, Director of Modern Language Teaching, uh, who's doing a course for Future Learn. So I'm just recording this interview, trying to be interesting if I can, um, trying my video skills. Got a couple of cameras going on. So that's some of the things that I'm working on right now are, are these video skills such as they are. Uh, I mean, I'm a learning technologist, um, but I'm also a philosopher and I'm also a journalist and, um, I, you know, a computer science education, you know, that, that area where all of these things come together, that's me. And uh, what am I working on now? Well, uh, obviously not taking care of my plants, um, well, uh, I've got something that I've been going on for the last couple of years called Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care, and uh, I offered a MOOC in that, a massive open online course, uh, last year, and I'll be doing that again this year, at least that's the current plan. Uh, and that's been a really interesting investigation for me. You can see how it blends in these different things that I've been working on. I also did a big project in the spring, winter and spring, on data literacy. And I'm not sure what that will turn into. Um, I created a unmook for that that I sort of semi-offered. I don't think anyone actually looked at it, uh, but it's there, it's data.mooc.ca, and that's all my stuff. So my camera is desperately trying to focus. I can't move around too much with this camera. This is my Fujifilm X-T200, and I've got that set up as a webcam. And then this is just a Logitech webcam. I'm not really sure whether the Fujifilm is actually producing a better image, although in theory it should be. Uh, but I'm recording this on OBS, Open Broadcasting System, I think that's what it's called. Um, and that has its point of view as to what the video quality is going to be coming in. Maybe if I moved closer to this camera. That might make it happier, or if I zoomed in. That's one of the things I can do with this camera, is I can zoom in a bit. There we go. Now I'm a big, giant head. Um, I also, over the last few years, have been working on what I called eLearning 3.0, and what I guess now I would call Ed 3. And that's a, a list of a series of technologies drawing from some of the new blockchain stuff that's been happening. I've got a whole research area on blockchain and I, I wrote some of my own blockchain software, which nobody used because that's what typically happens to my software. Um, and uh, also cloud technologies, the influence of that, of the graph, uh, I've been messing around with my own learning application called Grasshopper and uh, trying to get that into a good graph knowledge base kind of form. I also use it for my e-learning newsletter called OL Daily and um, I've been trying to adapt it to use it for my writing and mm, it's not really working yet. Uh, I have some good ideas but you know there's only so much time in the day. Uh, I work with the National Research Council of Canada, and that's my day job. And uh, the day job have me, has me doing things like the uh, data ethics stuff and other project work. So, but it's a pretty good mix. Um, 
you know, the, the things I enjoy doing, I have a series of videos called Stephen Follows Instructions, where I go to a website that says, here's how you do such and such. And it's always a tech kind of topic. And so I, I follow the instructions and they go hilariously wrong because the instructions are almost never adequate to actually do the task without the right background knowledge and I'm stupid I don't have the right background knowledge so that's who I am I live in Canada in a small town in eastern Ontario boy it's really not focusing is it is that better no it just doesn't like to focus okay well we'll just stick to the other camera mostly throughout that's why you have backups right um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Well, that's a good question. Um, here's the official story. Um, connectivism is the thesis that knowledge is formed of the connections between a set of independent entities where a connection is uh, anything linking the two entities such that a, a change of state in one entity can result in a change of state in the second entity. And notice I didn't say cause, I used result in. And notice I'm using the generic term entity rather than person or neuron or cricket. And it's because the idea is pretty generic, right? It says knowledge is the organization of connected things, basically. And it really doesn't matter what those things are. And that's a really important point. And learning, therefore, is the capacity or the act of creating those connections or growing those connections, or maybe sometimes constructing them, although that almost never happens, um, and shaping them, strengthening them, weakening them, perhaps eliminating them, trimming them. It depends on what your exact psychology is as to whether knowledge is created by growing new connections or trimming all of the connections that we have. There are stories for both of those. And, you know, that theory isn't unique to connectivism. Um, we see it in other, other areas of study. In connectionism, which is a branch of study in computer science, uh, that was the source of artificial neuro, neural networks. And these form the basis of artificial intelligence today, these artificial neural, neural networks. You begin with what were called perceptrons. And now we've grown or developed what are called deep neural networks, or multi-layer neural networks. You have not just an input layer and an output layer, but you have many layers in between. Layers of connected, well, whatever. In this case, artificial neurons which are, you know, just computer-defined objects with different values and properties. And what a learning theory is on this picture is very different from what we see in education. What a learning theory is, is the description of how these connections form, grow, or shape. And so we talk in terms of, or at least I talk in terms of, say an activation value or an activation function which describes what it will take to get a neuron to send a signal to the next neuron um, or a threshold um, which is a way of kind of filtering the input until it reaches a certain point and that impacts you know how how the neuron is going to fire um, I think sometimes in terms of the weight of the connections between the neurons. You know, you send one signal at a 0 0.6 weight, you get a result of 0 0.6. Another signal 
at a weight of 0 0.3 weight, you have a weight of 0 0.3. You could say add those up, you have 0 0.9. Although you probably don't want to just add them up because you know, connectionist systems like to work between a scale of 0 and 1. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the way these functions are described are normalized to hit that range. And there's a bunch of advantages that come from that. But connectivism is a bit more than that. You take the same ideas and you apply it to say epidemiology. And now you're talking about uh, what it means for a disease to spread through society. And what makes the disease more or less likely to be transmitted. And you can talk about uh, you know, again, thresholds and weights, you know, how contagious is the disease? How much of an influence does it take? What is the channel, you know, air or water or whatever? Um, and even more, you can talk about these networks of connections becoming self-organizing. This is something that Duncan J. Watts talked about. Uh, in Six Degrees, I think it was him. If not, it was someone else similar to him, but I'm pretty sure it was him. Uh, crickets chirping at night. Now, each cricket is a separate and independent entity. Um, you know, but when, when one cricket chirps, that increases the propensity of another cricket to chirp, which influences yet another cricket. And what's interesting is, Although there's no head cricket, there's no cricket in charge, there is no cricket leadership, but they all chirp in a symphony, a self-organizing symphony. And we see the same phenomenon in a murmuration of blackbirds, where there's no head blackbird, but there's this big flock going through the air, and it forms different shapes and all of that. And again, the flock is self-organizing, and the way that's working is, you know, just any individual member of the flock might say spot a danger, a fox in the, in the weeds or something, and react, and that influences the next few blackbirds, and they react, and then the others react, and the motion goes through the entire flock. Small blackbird to blackbird communications. There, there is no broadcasting or mass media for blackbirds, and yet they're organized. I find that really interesting. And connectivism for me is the study of what makes this kind of self-organizing neural network work from the perspective of being able to know, where being able to know means being able to carry yourself or conduct yourself in the world or something vague like that. And of course we can't deal with something vague like that, so I need another story. And my other story is not a story about knowledge being a collection of facts or rules or principles for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but knowledge as recognition. What is it to know your grandmother? Well, simple example, if she walks in through the train station, you just pick her up. You recognize her immediately. And it's not based on any rule or principle. You didn't go down a list. She's wearing a red sweater. She's got two legs. She has gray hair. Nothing like that. You look at her, you recognize her. I, I sometimes define it as, you know, uh, to know is like uh, when you find where's Waldo or where's Wally in that great big picture and you look and you look and you look and you finally spot him in the middle of the picture and once you know where he is you can't not know where he is. That's what knowledge is. It's you can't not know. It's something you recognize. It's something you know when you have it it feels like it's built in. Um, you know, and that's why a lot of people talk about, you know, expert knowledge and intuition is just being, you, know, you don't think about it, you just do it. Uh, and that leads a lot of other people to talk about knowledge as 
something that's not just cognitive, and I certainly agree with that, but something more, something that's embodied. And I talk about it like that as well a lot as well. Um, thinking of it as something that we grow rather than something that we build or that we create or that we acquire. To, to know something is to actually develop a physical structure in the brain, this set of connections of neurons such that when grandmother walks through the train station, you go, ah, there's grandmother. So that's the knowledge and learning part of it. And then the rest of it, and, and I would say the part especially that George talks about, George Siemens, um, is how do we take something like that picture of learning and apply it to education? And it, it's a hard question, right? It's still just gonna, maybe if I sit back, Yeah, it's not bad. It's sort of settled down. Me. Yeah, I must have been just a bit too close to it. Yeah, but if I sit back here, is my volume going to be enough? These are the sorts of questions that also bother me. And it's it's funny how you can take there it goes again. You take questions about connections and organization, and then you apply them to practical things like working with video cameras, or in this case not working with video cameras and it's it's uh you know it gets complex but it gets really interesting in a hurry so anyhow that's the short story i guess of what i think connectionism is or connectivism is and, and i could go on a lot longer about that but i'm sure that you don't want me to um yeah Well, that's a hard question because it, it brings in some stuff. Um, and, and this stuff varies depending on where you are, but let, let's look at the stuff that it brings into. Uh, standard university courses, quote unquote, delivered, which is exactly what learning is not on a blended learning basis. So blended learning usually means, although, you know, since the pandemic, that meaning has shifted a bit, but usually means a combination of online and offline, quote unquote, instruction. So when people talk about blended learning, especially in the before times, and the before times means before the COVID pandemic, uh, usually what they meant was typical in-person classes, but supplemented with online resources. And that was the, the whole point of things like um, Murray Goldberg's, Murray Goldberg's um, WebCT, Web Course Tools, right? It was intended to be a suite of tools that university instructors would use. Of course, it morphed. It became a delivery tool, just like all the rest of the learning management systems. And that's not surprising because that's what the standard university course is, right? It's something that's delivered. You think about it, it's a series of lectures um, that are prepared, hopefully, but often not, by a professor that are then given or rated, perhaps with PowerPoint, perhaps with chalkboard work. That's how I used to do it because we didn't have PowerPoint in the classroom when I was teaching in the classroom. Um, and then that could be, wasn't always, but could be supplemented with labs or hand-on activities, certainly in all the sciences and uh, even things like geography, that was expected. There was a geography lab, we did that. Um, 
could be supplemented with discussions. Now, these would often happen inside the class, although later on, uh, these discussions were conducted in discussion forums. And one of the very earliest experiences I had with uh, blended learning or online learning was in, uh, when was it exactly? 1986, John A. Baker's Philosophy of Mind course. And we used the university conferencing system and had this incredible discussion of the topics of this course on philosophy of mind. It was fabulous. I still have the, all the printouts for that. Uh, and it makes for quite interesting reading, even today. One of my favorites was an article called Digging Up Behaviorism by one of the participants in the course. Um, and then, of course, the learning in this course is measured through the submission of written material, usually written material, virtually always written material, um, essays, perhaps, uh, exam answers. Uh, in a lot of the sciences, it's multiple choice because the scientists are having a 400 person lectures and no human can mark that many essays uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So they have multiple choice and eventually these would be marked by machine. They used to be marked by hand, but what you do is, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have a template and you just put the template over and you can see all the places where they got it wrong. Uh, so it's still pretty quick to mark. So what are the implications of connectivism on that picture? Well, you could do all of that, uh, you know, because connectivism isn't about how you deliver the education. And that's something I haven't said before. As soon as I say it, I realize that it's true. Uh, it really has nothing to do with how the, the education is delivered. It has everything to do with how the learner learns. Um, and the whole idea of connectivism is to understand as a learner that you aren't trying to acquire a bunch of facts. It also requires, you know, it, it also means being pretty pragmatic, right? Uh, the pragmatic thing when you're a connectivist taking a traditional university course is that they, the instructors, expect a performance from you. And so your objective in the course is to deliver this performance, whatever it happens to be. Uh, one of the things that I found out, I don't know if this applies in other disciplines, but I found out about halfway through my university career is that you can organize everything. And if you organize everything, you have three parts of this, two parts of that, uh, four parts of this, you know, what are, what are the... You know, what, what are the uh, the four major theories of ethics, right? Consequentialism, contract theory, virtue ethics, and deontology, or the ethics of duty and responsibility. And then you subdivide those, you subdivide those, put up a few arguments for and against. Uh, the essays write themselves, all right? Um, so what happened there and this I do know happens in other disciplines, is a case of pattern recognition. I saw the pattern. I saw what kind of pattern they were looking for. And once I learned how to deliver that pattern, it was straight A's from then on. It, was, it got easy. Um, and it's, it's uh, almost, you know, my, my university careers, you know, I started out as a, as a B to B minus student. And then the next year I'm a B plus, and then an A minus, and then just straight A's all the way through. Uh, except for logic, where you couldn't do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, logic was my bugbear. Because uh, logic's a whole different set of patterns, and, and, and a bunch of stuff. Um, what got me with logic is substitutivity. Uh, the idea that you can take a long expression 
a equals f x of whatever or whatever whatever take all of that replace it with a and put that into another equation I've always been deeply suspicious of moves like that but apparently they work and I remember a philosophy of mathematics class with Farino Huber Dyson at the University of Calgary where we looked at that kind of question and it was you know, it's the thing of what makes us think we can just take this and substitute it for that we assume uh, we can take an expression like 2 plus 3 and replace it with 5 and we haven't changed anything um, we assume we can take an expression like a plus b and replace it with c and we haven't changed anything but why would we assume that right and so again the patterns fall on patterns fall on patterns um, once you see that that's what you're up to once you see that what you're looking for are patterns in the ether then it doesn't matter how they're teaching you if you're interested in teaching from a connectivist perspective what you're trying to do is well again you know I mean you're working for a university um, delivering standard university courses and you need to make it so that they can pass the course otherwise you won't stay employed as a professor because what you really want to do is help people become better at recognizing patterns um, and that's not always the kind of thing that is going to immediately help somebody pass the course it takes a little time I used to teach logic courses and uh, I had the the formal curriculum that I was supposed to follow but for me more than half the course probably about three quarters of the course was how do you understand what something means uh, when you're reading a piece of text or uh, interpreting what something has what somebody has said you know, I look at this this question that we're dealing with here and I immediately see the patterns the implications you know I'm doing this analysis of this thing almost automatically now it's many years later and that's what I'm trying to get people to do and so in a discipline physics math geography uh, business what I'm trying to do is get them to be able to understand what other people in that profession are saying not the simplest thing in the world and that's not teaching them a whole bunch of facts one upon the other it's teaching them how to be fluent in a language and how to be fluent in a language is to learn to recognize the patterns learn to recognize the grammars learn to recognize what counts as evidence what counts as a problem what are accepted methods of proving a response um, you know why it's okay to use cases in a business class but they'll laugh at you if you do that in a physics class that sort of thing uh, but you probably want something more practical than that and the practicality is that really you're going to be setting up almost a double curriculum right there's the curriculum the formal knowledge and so you're responsible for presenting that and I think it's good if you have uh, you know an affinity for that content um, a desire to talk about that content uh, you know so that people see your engagement with it and your interest in it because that helps them become engaged in it and interested in it and what you're trying to demonstrate by that presentation is uh, how a person in that discipline talks and thinks and works that that's what you're actually modeling they, they can find the facts for themselves you can show them where to find them but really you're presenting 
that. And then the, the other part is the generic skills part of it. Um, you know, showing the sorts of practice and routines that you need to undertake in that discipline to grow that knowledge. Uh, apocryphally, Thomas Kuhn said that a science consists not of the information in the front of the chapter, but in the problems at the end of the chapter. And as someone who took a lot of science, I can tell you the what you need to know to solve the problems at the end of the chapter is often far more than the information that's given to you in the front of the chapter. And what they're trying to do is force you to see the world a certain way. And so anything you can do that helps people develop that kind of world view, that's what's going to get them through that class. You might think, well, what does that have to do with connectivism? That just sounds like good common sense. Well, yeah, it is good common sense, I think. But, you know, when you think of learning as growing a capacity as opposed to acquiring facts, the everything you do presenting yourself becomes different like well, this response here becomes different it's not just me telling you what it is it's me trying to work it through as i tell you what it is so you can see how i think about it even if that thinking sometimes gets fuzzy see i'm trying to work in the uh the video effect here uh you know as well as to get the content across. Well, to me, I guess the answer is it looks like, it looks like a week of my life. <laughs> Any one of my weeks. Um, I try to do really practical hands-on learning and, and I'm doing it on a constant basis. I have a job, I'm lucky enough to have such a job uh, that allows me to do that. Although I will say in any job that I've had in the past, that's what I've made the job about, is using every aspect of the job to learn. Every task, everything you're given becomes a learning opportunity. Even if it's something boring like accounting, Okay, I'm sorry, accountants who are listening, but yeah, it's boring. I've done it. Um, you know, but then you're thinking about, well, how can I make this practice better? How can I make it more reliable? Um, you know, so on. Um, as well, you know, I didn't cover this in the earlier segment, but... Uh, you know, the, the principles of a connectivist network and therefore the principles of connectivist learning, I know that doesn't follow, but go with me, are, well, what I call the semantic principle, uh, autonomy, diversity, openness, and interactivity. And now that's not intended to be definitive. You can come up with your own versions of, this, of those terms. You can come up with a different list. It's supposed to be empirical. They describe the functioning of a semantically good network, that is, one that's going to reliably produce knowledge. And so I take those principles and I apply them to my own life. And so my day-to-day -day work includes diversity. I try to do a bunch of different things. People say you should focus. And focus is good. Too much focus is awful. Um, you know, I, I still remember, you know, I was being recruited by a Scientologist on the street and they, they run you through this interview. And so, you know, it's sort of like a test, right? So I went through their test and they said, well, okay, you see you got lots of capacities and lots of things, but what you seem to lack is focus. And you should narrow your field so that you're really looking at one thing and really get good at that. And I thought, yeah, I see the sense in that advice, but I thought it was terrible advice. 
um, yeah, you, you can become an expert in something, and I do recommend it, but never become an expert in just one thing. And so my day-to-day -day activities include messing around with video, um, even video when it's not working well, um, messing around with video production, as I'm doing here, um, you know, uh, making a video, writing something, doing my newsletter, uh, any given day, I'll have a bunch of different things that I'm doing. And even on those days that I have to focus, and okay, there are those days. I just got through a week of them where I had to finish writing this paper. But then once you've done that, you move on to something else. And that's really important. And so I go for these diverse activities. And I try to keep them as diverse as possible. You know, uh, technology, photography, cycling say uh, pretty to me that's a pretty wide range of activities but then trying to see the patterns that connect them right because there are patterns that connect them and then trying to do new things in them autonomy uh, I have always taken it as a matter of principle that I am the one who's responsible for my own learning and that if I depended on my employer especially or even my educators for my own learning I'd be getting a very shallow version of what I could actually be learning. Um, you know, again, learning is an ongoing every day, almost every minute of every day activity. Keep in mind, you know, your brain, my brain anyways, probably your brain too, uh, is constantly adjusting these connections. So, um, you need to attend to that um, in the sense of taking proactive action to give yourself these diverse experiences and try these new things. Maybe not dangerous things like skydiving, is, that's not for me. Might be for you and you probably learn a ton doing it. But, you know, go, go, getting out there and trying things that you're not sure you'll succeed at is really important. That's why I love my Stephen Follows Instructions series. It's a, it's a litany of failure, but the failures themselves are really so interesting that I think the entire series is engaging just because the stuff never works. If, you know, if they were better edited so that they're not four hour long videos, but say 20 minute videos with just the highlights, uh, that'd probably be pretty good. But I don't have that much patience. Openness is really key to me, and openness means a lot of things. Um, it means sh being sharing. Uh, it means being receptive to new ideas. It means being open to new perspectives, to other people, um, other forms of life. Um, um, you know, and, you know, people talk about tolerance and understanding uh, I talk about uh, embracing and celebrating. I mean, you know, somebody who lives their life in a completely different way from a completely different culture or, uh, or linguistic or whatever perspective from me, that's something to be celebrated because that's the person I can learn from. And interactivity. Um, the idea that knowledge comes from us engaging in conversation you can see how all these things fit together right if we all think the same thing what are we going to talk about right but the only way to prevent us from all thinking the same thing is for each person to think their own thing and live their own lives and have their own experiences and then we've got tons to talk about and the objective of these conversations is not to come to agreement on stuff um you know, people always say, well, yeah, we're, we're trying to get to, to shared values and common principles and, uh, you know, uh, a shared vocabulary. Um, there are points of interaction and syntactically we need to be kind of in accord in the sense that, uh, you know, when I speak, you have to have the physical capacity to hear the words. Um, but the words that come out of my mouth are going to mean one thing to me. And when they go into your ears, they're going to mean something probably slightly different or maybe very different to you. 
and that that's also par for the course. Now the 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 purpose of the interaction isn't to come to some sort of common agreement, even if sometimes we can work together to produce uh, mutual value for each other through the exchange. Well, the, the purpose of the exchange is to learn. And I learn what I need to learn, and you need to learn what you need to learn, and then we do our thing. And it's not about coordination, it's about this self-organizing network. And so, I'm not trying to convince people of things when I get my papers or talk my talks. I'm, I'm barely even trying to explain what I'm doing, although I guess I'm kind of doing that now. Um, I'm trying to describe. This is my life. This is what it's like for me. These are the things that I think about. This is what I find interesting. This is what I find repulsive. Um, and you can say the same thing to me. And provided we have enough autonomy and enough freedom and enough space in our worlds, it works fine. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the diversity aspect of it and the autonomy aspect of it becomes a challenge when we're squeezed together, either by economic circumstances or physical circumstances or, you know, conditions of war, things like that, where um, you, know, you, you don't have that space anymore. Uh, you don't have that latitude but you know i grew up in the open country um and so i grew up in a place where there is lots of space and where people can live their own lives and that's something that i value it, it often comes back to that you know it often your 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 theory about the nature of the world comes back to well uh, where did you grow up uh were there grasshoppers in your backyard things like that Uh, that's kind of an odd question because why would I need my philosopher's hat on to say what is educational technology? But uh, you know, I, I I read the uh, the descriptions of the course and uh, you know, drawing on the work of Jean Baudrillard, nineteen ninety three, and the practices of social media companies such as Facebook. It explores how the online dimension might be seen as a rhetorical space that can be used to lure, in scare quotes, students into engaging with action effective for learning through the promise of, scare quotes, symbolic gifts. Now there's as cynical a sentence as I've ever read, and uh, I won't put it on the screen. If you didn't quite get it, you can back up the video because the video can do that. Um, and yeah, okay, I get that. And so the first thing that the philosopher says is, well, what is a technology? You know, because we think of technology as being about gears and pulleys, or these days about you know, keyboards, mice, screens, stuff like that. But a technology you know, from the philosophical sense is just any organized way of going about doing something to produce some kind of predictable result. That's an off the cuff definition. I, I used to think, no, technology has to be about stuff. I was corrected of that uh, when I was working at Assiniboine Community College all those years ago. And they had a program called Swine Technology. And no, it wasn't about the tools that you use to raise pigs. It was about the manner and practice of raising pigs. Um, and yeah, okay, technology. You know, so what is educational technology? The very concept of educating somebody is a technology. And that's why we get, you know, you know, a rhetorical space that can be used to lure students into engaging with action effective for learning, right? 
that's a technology on this picture. That's the practice, right? Um, so is that educational technology for me with my hat on? My philosopher's hat. I was actually going to put a physical hat on, but I couldn't find one. And you see, to me, that sentence is propaganda. Um, it's propaganda technology. When you lead somebody or lure them or whatever to do anything that leads them to have a predictable learning outcome, that's propaganda. Now, you might say most learning, therefore, most education, therefore, is propaganda. And my response is, well, yeah. What did you think it was? Um, you know, because when you learn 2 plus 2 equals 4, you learn two things. One thing you learn is about a manipulation of some formal symbols. A 2 plus a 2 equals a 4. The second thing you learn is these formal symbols are valuable in some way. And that's the propaganda thing. And when education emphasizes things like language and mathematics, what we are saying is things like language and mathematics are the most important things in our society. Um, but that's not a fact. That's an opinion. And that's an effort to shape a student into having a particular perspective on what they ought to do and how they ought to conduct themselves in society. And remember I said earlier, a discipline is a, isn't a series of facts piled up on each other. A discipline is a way of looking at the world. Uh, what questions to ask, what counts as evidence, what are genuine problems, uh, what are the terms that we use. So what we're doing when we teach people language and math is setting themselves up as being members of that particular discipline, we call it today citizen or whatever you want to call it, that thinks that things like language and mathematics are important. Or another way of putting it, thinks that things like law and science are important. You should just be law, right? Uh, you know, can you follow instructions? The mathematics didn't come until 1959 and the launch of Sputnik. And then people realize, oh, geez, we're going to need engineers. Um, and then all of a sudden math became really important as well, as, as opposed to, you know, something that Einstein's studied. Um, and it's funny, you know, I mean, propaganda begins with the selection of the topic that you're going to talk about. Um, and then all the things that you're going to say about it. It's just, just like the media. I told you, I have a very diverse experience. I have lots of experience in journalism. The first editorial decision that's made in a newsroom is what story to cover. What counts as news? Right? Man, or dog bites man, not news. Man bites dog, news. Well, I got bitten by a dog about two or three weeks ago, and believe me, that was news to me. But it would never get covered. Well, unless it got covered from there some, and never mind. You get the idea. Um, and so education, when presented that way, is a mechanism for producing specific members of a specific way of looking at the world, of specific members of specific disciplines, which we will later subdivide into matters of law or matters of science, right? So, you know, matters of social science, we call them now, or matters of physical science or hard science, we call them. And those who fail at both of those work at McDonald's. They become part of the service sector. 
and we treat them badly because they don't have the things that we value, which is knowledge of language and knowledge of math. Plus, a good sized inheritance also helps. Um, and when you set things up that way, all kinds of stuff follows, including a lot of the reason for a lot of the angst that has been shown in the EdTech community, like, like measurement of student achievement, for example is a matter of numbers, right? Um, creating learning resources. What resources to create, how to create them, matters of copyright, those are matters of law. Again, I've never divided the world in this way before, matters of law, matters of, law, or of math or science, but it, again, pattern recognition, right? You, you go through an exercise like this, boom, find a pattern, run with it. Um, but none of that is education. It's propaganda. So what is education? Well, if you ask me, and by definition, since it's an interview, you are asking me, you're not getting the answer as quickly as you might like, but um, an education or learning is helping people develop the capacity to learn um the that's a train going by because i near live near train tracks you know why because i like trains so we'll just let the train go by <laughs> um this was a, a fast quiet one they vary quite a bit and you notice the variations you notice when they're 10 minutes late in the morning that's kind of funny um you know, what makes a person able to learn about the world? What makes a person able to make the best way for themselves in the world? To have the best life? Um, you know, the first part of that answer is, well, almost certainly not going into math. Or sorry, almost certainly not going into law or science. Almost certainly not going into uh, legal matters or finance. Um, you know. Maybe I should have said finance instead of science. That might have been a better, you know, the, the really important things in our world, law and finance. Science is an afterthought. Um, you know, how do you transcend that world? How do you make the elements of that world work for yourself? How do you become able to learn from anything and not, simply from what is given to you through explicit instruction how do you grow and develop as a learner how do you distinguish between what will help you aka is true and what will harm you aka is false in all of the things that you're presented with during the course of a day um, how do you go on how do you avoid hurting yourself, um, either deliberately or by accident? How do you get on with other people? Those are the hard questions. Um, and those are the questions that we really need to be able to get a grip on in order to flourish and be developed uh, as a fully functioning human being. Those are the sorts of things I add parenthetically that they actually teach in what might be called the posh schools, right? Um, you know, there's that slogan, uh, World War II was won on the, or was it World War II? Or Waterloo, whatever, one or the other, was won on the playing fields of Eton. Um, it wasn't about battle tactics or anything like that. It was about something a lot more subtle than that. Just having that resilience to just to pick a popular word of the day. Um, having the self-confidence, the belief in one's own inner worth and value um, and character to carry yourself through the day. And you're not getting that in law and finance. Or 
language and science, right? That's not what those are teaching you. Those are teaching you formal disciplines that allow you to produce the right answer and interact appropriately in the mechanisms of society. But they're not helping you become educated. So educational technology for me is the creation of spaces that offer significant challenge but also the possibility of significant achievement so that these characteristics can be developed. Now, are you going to ask me to give you a list of these characteristics? I did write an article once um, titled variously, What We Really Need to Learn or What You Really Need to Learn. Uh, ranging from how to predict consequences to how to value oneself. Um, but it's a lot more subtle than that. It's a lot more about being able to define your own discipline rather than merely fit into some other discipline. Define your own questions that are worth asking defining for yourself what counts as evidence, defining for yourself what words mean, what experiences matter, things like that. I know that's really vague um, and not precise. And I think that's necessarily how it has to be. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's recognition again. Uh, it's almost like, you know what it is when you see it. You know what it is when you experience it. Um, and you experience it at different points in different places in your life. And then you're always trying to, to bring those things back. I, I watch videos of people who walk, walk the Appalachian Trail. And, and uh, they take about six months to do it. And they come back a different person than they were when they left. And from what I can see, for the most part, a better person. It's the sort of thing I want to do one day. And what's happened there is they've managed somehow through that experience to capture that thing. Um, you really have to think a lot of yourself to try to walk the Appalachian Trail or to do anything difficult like that. And you have to get past these questions of who am I to try to do this? Um, you know, what gives me the right to take six months out of my life and simply try to do something that has no economic value whatsoever? But when you learn to be able to ask these questions and do these things, that's when you've become educated. It has nothing to do with language and science, law and finance. Nothing. Again, I should have music for these interludes, but that's one of these skills I never learned. I tried to learn music in school, in high school, and, and they asked me to pick an instrument, so I picked the drums, which I thought was pretty smart. But then they, they gave me a drum, gave me some rudimentary instruction, put me in a little 10 by 10 room called the drum room, and said, practice. And... <laughs> This was an after-school activity, and you know, I was trying to socialize and get with everyone else. And they put me in this 10 by 10 room for hours at a time and said, practice, and that was my musical experience. That's not the future of teaching and learning in higher education. Um, you know, we, we can get back to people like, say, Jim Groom or Brian Lamb or those others who see it more as, you know, being a DJ or, or jazz improv. They have their band, the Dead Mook Men, and just as an aside, not a good band. But <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, and it's probably more like that. Uh, than the drum room. The drum room is a terrible idea. 
plus in it. Um, and yet that's most of what our learning is today, right? We take people, we put them in a room, and we tell them, oh, geez, we don't even tell them practice. We tell them, listen. And then maybe if we're lucky, practice. And it's completely separated from the rest of the band. But the way to learn is to play with the band. I know, I'm running away with this metaphor. But you get my point, right? Um, higher education and schooling generally, but higher education especially, is the way it is because of some very particular circumstances that no longer hold. And those circumstances are based around the idea of scarcity and especially scarcity of learning resources like books. You had to go to a place to get to access a book. It's not like they were all around the way they are now. Today, writing is everywhere. We take it for granted. Um, you know, but at the beginning of universities, writing wasn't everywhere. You had to go to places to get it. And you had to go to places to access um, both the lessons and the ear of educated people. Again, today educated people are all around, but back, you know, in the 1400s, 1500s, 1800s, educated people weren't all around. And even a lot of the people who were supposed to be educated weren't really that educated at all. Um, you know, you, you think about, and I, I always think back to, uh, it's the F. Scott Fitzgerald book. I believe it's called This Side of Paradise. It's about his experiences at Princeton University. Or about someone's experiences. I'm not enough of a Fitzgerald scholar to say whether they were his experiences or not. But, you know, um, they went through a couple of years of preparatory school, went straight into university, read with an instructor, uh, and then were turned loose on the world as educated men. Most of their education actually took place in their prep school, the fields of Eton again. Um, and then they did some reading, and that was education. So, yeah, you, you had to bring people together. And that's what we kept doing. And now we have a situation, and, and it's growing more and more apparent, that uh, it really takes a lot of resources to bring any significant part of the population together to put them in a position to be able to meet what are genuinely now very educated people with massive university libraries. And there's no need. And that's the thing. There's no need to do it that way. And people always say, well, yeah, but you need to learn to be socialized and, uh, you know, and all of that. And yeah, you do. But whoever said the university is the only place to do that? I mean, the rest of society, which you might not be familiar with, but is still the majority of people in the world and probably in your own country, managed to do it without university. They still become socialized. They didn't all become criminal psychopaths. I know that's an exaggeration, but you get the idea. Now, what they didn't get are all the niceties of upper privileged class life. Uh, and that's what bringing people together does, right? It creates this separate class with its own ways, uh, its own values. Just look at the difference of the values expressed by the people who are in power and the rest of us. Night and day, it really is. And, and you know, the, the people who are in power will talk a good game about these values, but when you look at what they actually do, uh, it's something very different. And that's what the traditional system produced, right? And that's its current product. And that's why it's in trouble, because its current product is becoming watered down. 
um, try as they might by raising the price, too many people are accessing it and it's losing this value of creating an elite. So you have this subset of elite institutions and then all the rest of them and that creates your differentiation again but now all you've done is divide society into three segments. Um, and that middle segment, formerly called the middle class, is getting squeezed um, more and more. Obviously not a sustainable system. And it's not a sustainable system because a system that produces that kind of an elite is not a sustainable system. Uh, I read... I forget where, it was the Atlantic or the New Yorker or something. Um, or it might have been the Jacobin. <laughs> um, you know, the, the capitalist system where we have a society controlled basically by a small mercantile class of rich and powerful is something that successful civilizations through history have managed to avoid and the societies that were not successful in preventing these they collapsed and uh, arguably um, arguably we're headed that way ourselves through overconsumption of resources degradation of the environment etc etc I could go on and higher education has to fit in with all of that. So I read something like Brian Alexander, who wrote this week, he says, you know, I guess the consensus is gone that everybody should have a higher education. And that really, that's not the case anymore. And I, I sort of responded back, well, the consensus where you live is, is eroding. But, um, you know, in the societies that are less class-based, the consensus is, you know, the more education for people, the better. In the societies where it is class-based, the consensus is changing so that it's something like only the fewest should receive, or not only the fewest, but a smaller percentage of the people should receive higher education, and something else is good for everyone else. And that's the basis for a lot of this discussion about, you know, non-degree pathways to success or non-college pathways to success, etc. And so long as we have a higher education system conferring unique advantage on a small class of people, this alternative view of higher education isn't ever really going to take off because, you know, people have aspirations. So, what is the future of teaching and learning in higher education. Well, I'm not allowed to say blow the whole thing up. Um, maybe I am allowed to say replace the whole thing. Um, again, I'm thinking of a lot of the ed tech, ed tech angst that's been expressed in the blogosphere recently and people wondering about their roles in the system that is gradually privatizing and commodifying learning in society generally. Um, and, and more, right? And they thought, you know, at the beginning of all of this, at the beginning of open educational resources, at the beginning of online learning, they thought that they were developing something that was genuinely empowering for society and could create something more egalitarian and more accessible for everybody. But over time, this point of view has been co-opted by private industry and you know, the, the elite institutions of higher education. And there's a good argument for that. Look what happened to the MOOC, the massive open online course. George Siemens and I developed this model, very distributed, very egalitarian, nobody really in control, no central authority, a network, a murmuration, self-organization, knowledge created just out of our own interaction. 
And that vision was, shall we say, unacceptable um, to institutions like Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and the rest, who are as in, who are, in terms of education, as interested in propaganda as they are in learning. Learning for their own students, propaganda for the rest. And I know that sounds harsh, but if you do the analysis, and I am a philosopher, that's what you get. So I've never felt that we would accomplish what we, educational technologists, generally spoken as a community from my admittedly idiosyncratic perspective. I've never thought of this as ever going to happen through changes in existing institutions. I even include government in that. I'm not an anarchist and I'm not saying we get rid of government because that's stupid. But the way we organize society in formal, rigid, and generally hierarchical structures needs to be replaced with something like these networks. And the question is, well, there's a twofold question, right? First of all, how do we get from here to there? And the answer, in, in, the, in this case, to this particular question is, well, not by changing the existing institution. We need to set up the alternative, and gradually the alternative replaces the institution. The second question is, how do we do it without creating a disaster in the meantime? And we might say, and I would agree, well, you know, the current system is creating a disaster. What do you think the global climate crisis is, among others? You know, I agree. But, you know, we could imagine worse cases. Um, and we could imagine replacing one system of institutions and education and the rest with another where these other institutions fail completely and then you don't have any government or any education and that is the end of society. You know, how do we know the self-organizing model won't self-organize itself over a cliff? And that's the hard question. Look at self-organizing models like blockchain, yeah, uh, which were immediately captured by speculators and gamblers who use it as you know, a, a financial plaything. Um, cooperatives get corrupt or bought out. Uh, open source software like Audacity, wonderful open source audio recording and editing tool, gets sold, gets bought, gets a whole bunch of trackers put into it, co-opted. Um, open educational resources. A whole bunch of people contribute a whole bunch of open educational resources to Lumen Learning. Lumen Learning turns around and sells them to Course Hero that uses them as a marketing platform. Ooh, scummy. Right? So the question is, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid these networked organizations from what? You know, how do you prevent them from walking off the cliff? And that's why I always get back to the semantic condition, because I think the semantic condition is the tool to do the job. But the semantic condition can't be a semantic condition. It's got to be built into the technology itself. And I can hear somebody now going, oh, God, he's recommending a technology-based solution. Uh, well, this is about technology. Um, but there's a point to that. And, you know, we, we have two ways of doing this. Either change human nature or change the technology. Now, you can change human nature. You know, I mean, there, there is such a thing as the quote-unquote growth mindset. You can change human nature, but doing it society-wide on a permanent basis really is a long shot. On the other hand, technological changes, um, they carry more risk. 
Um, they're not as democratic, but they do tend to have more wide-reaching and lasting impact. And if you don't believe me, if you think pedagogy should always lead technology, etc., etc., well, consider some technologies. The gun. The car. Nuclear weapons. These are things that have, you know, the way we've set them up and structured them in different societies very much determines the nature of that society. A society that allows guns everywhere has one look. A society that allows guns nowhere has a very different look. So it's the technology, but it's also the structure, the implementation, the rollout of technology. Not law, because, you know, the, the elite don't obey the law anyway, so you're not going to fix it that way. Um, but structurally, in some way. How does that look? What does that look like exactly? Kind of a hard picture to draw. I think of it as being kind of like language. Um, if we could imagine language without language schools. Language would still exist. It existed long before language schools. And a language is something that grows and is shaped organically by a society and contains the collective wisdom of that society. Not all of it, obviously, but certainly a good chunk of it. And we can characterize language in terms of rules and grammars and formalisms and vocabularies and semantics and things like that. But it isn't really any of these things. Um, it's, it's an object or a set of objects consisting of words and sounds and conventions that we all hold in common. And we all develop in common. Nobody owns a language as much as some publishers try. Um, and despite, you know, certain bodies like the French Academy, nobody controls what a language looks like. And I think something like that, um, only more technologically supported, is the future of teaching and learning in higher education. It's, that's a radically egalitarian picture because it, it implicates all of society in higher education. But of course, that's my aim anyways, so I don't see a problem there. And it's radically egalitarian in the sense that at any given point, anybody can be a teacher and anybody can be a learner. And what we know, what we believe to be true, is something that all of us together share in the formation of and the creation of. We've got some approximations of that now. Wikipedia is an approximation of that. It's not a good approximation of that, but, you know, compare uh, how knowledge is collected and formed and created in Wikipedia as compared to how it was done in the Encyclopedia Britannica. One is the voice of the people, the other is a colonial instrument. Um, you know, they're, they're very different. Um, Open source software is another, despite, you know, the, the various attempts to enclose it um, and turn it into private industry, um, which, you know, is caused in no small part by its libertarian roots in Berkeley and, and California. Um, nonetheless, open source software broadly conceived is something that is created by, belongs to, um, and is contributed to by the entire community and expresses, again, the amassed knowledge of computational processes of an entire community. Um, you virtually can't come up with new knowledge expressed computationally that is separate from that body of knowledge. Um, it would be wild and strange. Um, and so if we, we think about 
the other disciplines, including management and finance and geography and physics and the rest, being developed in this, being learned, developed, taught, passed on, created in this open network based egalitarian kind of way. That's probably what the future of education looks like. And so then the people who are actually using the elements of this knowledge, bits of geology, bits of astrophysics, bits of philosophy even, these people are actually using it and contributing to it all at once and all at the same time. So we come back to the question of what is learning technology? Learning technology is the science and discipline of how to make that happen to me. Um, and it's not one person's job, certainly not just my job. Um, and in, it includes things like Wikipedia and GitHub and also Octopus, which is a, a fantastic, fantastic JISC initiative that includes open data. Um, it includes, well, it includes Reddit and Metafilter. Um, it doesn't include Twitter and Facebook because these are monolithic, centrally controlled broadcasting networks that are used for propaganda, not for learning. And you see the difference, right? The propagandists use the broadcasting techniques, which includes traditional educational structures. But science and learning of the future are and will be more and more adopting these network-based approaches. Can we get to there from here? Question one. And can we get to there without walking ourselves off a cliff, including the cliffs created by the previous system? That's question two. I think those are both open questions, to be honest. Um, but that's the work that I'm doing. And that's the work that I believe educational technologists are doing. So, that's my interview. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. It was probably way, way more commentary than you wanted. So do feel free to edit judiciously or injudiciously. Uh, it certainly wasn't a prepared talk or anything like that. And a lot of it was just me you know, riffing off the top of my head. Um, but I hope you found it valuable. And uh, I hope you and the people in your course find something in this uh, worth taking forward, passing on in their own networks, building on, using to support their own perspectives, their own points of view. So that's it for me. I'm Stephen Downs once again. And uh, Neil, thanks for the prompt and the opportunity.